for Phil Howes. Good evening. Good evening. Um, don't worry about Star Trek, whether you know anything about it or nothing. All will be revealed. Okay, that's the first thing. The second thing is, don't worry too much about the slides I put up, about reading them, because it's really an aid memoir for me. Okay? And the last thing I say before I start the, the, the show is just to point out that you will know, you may know from my accent, but I'm not from round here. <laughs> I came from uh, up north. And you, you may be pleased to know that I'm one of the first, the first moves uh, of the government scheme of levelling up. <laughs> and I've come down here to level up so that we don't fall into the sea. Okay, so thank you for that. And um, I think, yes, I think I'm ready to, I'm ready to go. So here we go. I'm going to start with my origins. As you will see, born in Salford in Lancashire in 1947. Uh, like most people in Salford, I lived in a council house and my dad worked in the local foundry and my mother uh, worked at the local oil refinery. That was her career. But in 1947, when I was born, my mother made the decision to give up her career and become a part-time typist to look after me and my dad which of course is what women did at that time of, of, uh, of, of, of the thing. And um, the second box I would look at, I had a great childhood, really happy, but I was a bit of a rebel and I became an atheist and I dabbled a bit with communism. And uh, my last box is in 1970, I left Salford and went to Brighton where I started a whole new career in children's social work. And it's at this point, I just point you to the red box. It should say the 12th of July. I don't know how I'm supposed to put mail. <laughs> uh, but the 12th of July, 1969. And the first link is that the significant uh, person was a Mr. Geary, who was my maths teacher at Eccles Grammar School. And he persuaded me to join the astronomy club. And once I saw the stars and planets and the universe and space, I was absolutely taken. So on the 12th of July 1969, I'd just like you to imagine, I'm going to take you back there right now. Imagine you are sat at home, you're settling down, it's six o'clock, Saturday evening, on BBC, and you're about to watch this. Star Trek. First episode in Britain, in the UK. It had run for three years in the States, but this was the first time. And so, just to create an atmosphere, I'd just like to do this. Just listen. Space, the final frontier. These are the voyages of the Starship Enterprise. Its five-year mission to explore strange new worlds, to seek out new life, and new civilizations to boldly go where no one has gone before. <laughs> it absolutely hooked me there and then. And I thought, I've got to do some research here. And so my next port of call was the creator, Gene Roddenberry. And what really struck me about his vision for Star Trek was the bit where he says, humanity will reach its peak on the day that it begins to not just to tolerate but take a special delight in differences in ideas and differences in life forms and that struck a chord with me as well um, and in fact this was in the 60s so let's have a look at what was tolerated in the 60s okay Native Americans were protesting about land appropriation still and they were occupying the island of Alcatraz to make their point. Dr. Martin Luther King, the civil rights movement, was in full swing. And of course, America and the western, west of Europe was involved in a Cold War with Russia. And there was over half a million American GIs in a far-off war in Vietnam. Two specific things. In the USA, interracial marriages were not legal across the states, all the states, until 1967. And in the UK, if you were a single woman, 
you couldn't get a mortgage unless you could get a man to sign the mortgage papers for you. Yeah, that's what that was what was tolerated in the 60s. And so let me introduce you to Gene Roddenberry's idea, and this is the crew of the USS Enterprise. Anyone know who that is? Captain Kirk. Yeah. yeah. James Tiberius. Mr. Spock. Mr. Spock. Mr. Spock was an alien. He was from the planet Vulcan. This person here, she was only ever known as number one. Okay? Here we have uh, Leonard McCoy, Bones, the doctor. Here we have uh, Montgomery Scott, who was Scottish. Yeah. Pavel Chekhov, who was Russian. Mr. Sulu, who was Japanese. And last but not least, Lieutenant Uhuru was a black American woman. Mm -hmm. All of them in senior positions. I just want to talk about the two women to start with. Um, the <coughs> officer number one only appeared in the first series uh, in person. But from then on, you heard her voice all the time. She was the voice of the Enterprise's computer. And so she was the fount of all knowledge for the crew. They could just, just like Alexa today. Oh, could I have a cup of coffee, please? And it would go there. It would appear for you. Well, what's the planet like down there? Has it got life on it? And she would give you the full, uh, uh, the full SP. And Lieutenant Uhuru, if you want to know the impact that this had, then just let me move to this slide. Whoopi Goldberg, comedian and actress. She was only a child when she first saw uh, Star Trek. And she reports that when she saw it, she ran through the house shouting, Mama, Mama, everyone come here. Everyone get in here now. There's a black woman on TV, oh, wow. and she isn't a maid. Yeah, that's what the toleration was at that time. In fact, she was so um, so taken with the program. Um, it, she said it inspired her to become an actor. And later on, she actually asked, she requested to be uh, given a part in uh, Star Trek. She appeared in The Next Generation as an alien called Guinan, 600 years old, and she worked in 10 Forward. Anyone know where 10 Forward was on the Enterprise? The bar. The bar. Thank you. I've been there many times myself. And she used to dispense drinks along with wisdom to anyone who was in the bar who needed a shoulder to cry on or someone to talk to. So this takes me, I'm going to stick with the equality theme for this next slide. In 1973, I went to Salford College to train as a residential social worker. I got there, I turned up, and I found out, and when I walked in, I found I was one of only five men with 20 women on the course. And the course tutor was a clinical psychologist and was a woman also. And this was 20 women, oh, shall we say strong, quite powerful women, who knew that they had a career they wanted to create for themselves. And, of course, we were students. We went to the local, which was the Britannia pub, and up north, the, most of the pubs had this, but there was a room called the Vault. It basically was men only. But they had to put a sign on it that said, no women or dogs allowed. <laughs> now, it was about maybe two months into the course, and some of the women were saying, you know you go in the pub, right? You know you're colluding with this rubbish, yeah? By not saying anything about it. And the women actually persuaded myself and two of the other men to go and have a word with the landlord. And we actually managed to get him to take the sign down and to open up the vault to both men and women. And I have to say on that course uh, that if it, what it did for me, I think, um, it felt like I was having a, a bucket of cold water thrown over me every now and again. It was, like, it was like shocking but stimulating, the conversations that we had. So, from the equality and uh, the pub, this was a, a model that... Uh, that um, uh, the creator used and this was balanced leadership team he decided he was going to make it multi-ethnic but he also made if you look at the uh, thing in the center Kirk was courageous yet vulnerable <laughs> McCoy was cynical but actually acted as a confidant for Kirk mm -hmm. if you look at Spock he was logical he knew how we have critical friends he was the critical alien looking at the human race and giving an outsider's opinion at the top, Lieutenant Uhuru, absolutely massive knowledge of alien cultures, 
and re always remained calm under fire. <laughs> and Montgomery Scott, the Scottish guy, an engineer, he was the one who put Kirk's aspirations and made them into reality. Yeah? And if you looked at any management team in the 50s or the 60s, you would know that if there was a white male as the head, all the rest of the people would be white males. And Roddenberry uh, made it a point to actually surround Kirk with people with different abilities who balanced out Kirk's weaknesses. Yeah? And that, for me, again, had a really strong message to it about uh, management today. And if you wanted to, say, look at what uh, his vision was going to be like in the future, I think you could do no better than look at four inner London boroughs in which I work in. Mm -hmm. Islington, Hackney, Waltham, Forest and Lambeth. They were all equal opportunities boroughs. They were mixed gender, diverse, multicultural teams and communities that I work with. And they were really melting pots of different cultures generating new ideas every day. It just made you think and work uh, in a different way. And I'm just going to give you four examples of each borough. Islington, 1976. I worked at the Children's Observation and Assessment Centre. That was, that's a really a grand title for what was a last resort. For many of the children and young people who joined us uh, came having had maybe one, even six breakdowns in foster placements or adoptions or children's homes. So they came quite traumatised. And we took, two, um, we took two aims. One, the first one, inclusive teamwork. We had a multi-ethnic team, men made up of men and women in both uh, uh, the front line and senior positions. And we really uh, just said, the way we will work is that we will focus on rewards for children and young people and we'll try and keep the sanctions to a minimum. Mm -hmm. Now that wasn't easy, uh, but what that did was, there was a large staff group and we worked in shifts and teams. And what we made, the rule we made was that if you're on shift, if any of the children or young people erred, if you needed to win place a sanction, you did it there and then before the end of the shift. You didn't pass it on to another shift. And you also had to discuss it with the rest of the team on your shift, and it had to be able to be carried out by either men or women. And that stopped a lot of the sort of like macho male uh, carrying on about sanctions. And at the top I've written, do you remember when we? And this was our attempt to say, we may not, we may make a difference to the children. But one of the things we could do is, while you're here, we can give you a positive experience. And I remember the dark days and nights of the winter, when we used to pile maybe 10 or 12 children into the uh, school van, into the school bus. We'd take them out to Epping Forest, we'd get them out, we'd play this sort of like group form of hide and seek in the dark. We gave all the children, young people, torches. And then we'd pile them in the back. We'd come back, get to the kitchen. We'd all sit down and we'd have <coughs> fried egg sandwiches. <coughs> and we'd just talk about the fun we just had before they went to bed. <laughs> Prime Directive. Uh, Roddenberry, this was quite specific. No starship officer may interfere with the normal development of any alien life or society. This was a very, very subtle message that he didn't like assimilation, he didn't like colonialization, and he certainly didn't like slavery. He really pointed back to America's history and said, this is not the way to do things, there is a different way. And we were able to utilize the Prime Directive in Hackney. When I worked there, and, and, uh, there all, the young ch all, the, all the children who were in care were placed in Essex outside the borough. Some it was maybe an hour, two hours drive. And that was by car, by train or bus, it was even longer. And what we did was, we pulled young people who had to be looked after out of their families, away from their schools, away from their friends, and we placed them in either foster care or small group homes with families they'd never met before. And they were all white families. Bear in mind that Hackney had a high ethnic minority uh, population. And that really got quite close to breaking that sort of like rule that doctors have a do no harm, yeah? Very luckily, uh, we were able to work uh, with the council and we got the council to uh, bring out a new policy. We said, from this date forth, all children, uh, children and young people in Hackney who need to be looked after will be looked after within the borough boundary. 
and we started that process. We brought them back and we actually worked then to keep them in contact with their families, their friends, their schools, and it definitely worked better. I can give you another example. Roddenberry again. All Starfleet officers had a duty to make their captain aware of alternative actions or solutions. So there was a duty on people to say, whoa, hold on a minute, hold on a minute, I don't like this. There was a, another, a, another part of that was that the captain also had a duty to listen and to take any comments into account. And when I worked in Waltham Forest within the management team there, we came up with the idea of one side of A4. And we agreed as a team that what we would do is, if we were dealing with a problem or we came up with a solution, we would just check between us, did we all agree about that? And if anyone said, no, I'm not really sure about that, we'd say, one side of A4, identify the problem, identify the solution, and we yeah, will make sure that we come back together again and discuss it before we enact it. And that, for me, led to really good quality decisions, particularly in Waltham Forest, with a high Asian population. Mm -hmm. And I go on to my last example. The process of dealing with the unknown. Star Trek travels through the universe going to very unknown planets and meeting unknown civilizations. When I moved to Lambeth in 2001 as the head of children's services, Lambeth had had a really torrid time in the previous 15 years. Um, it had been as struck down by child abuse allegation after child abuse, and much of it had occurred in Lambeth children's homes. So it was a bit of a state. And we as a management team thought, okay, what's the first thing we need to do? And we decided the first thing was to actually give the frontline staff, the social workers, the confidence to go out there and work again, to safeguard the children and to keep the staff safe. And to say that if stuff goes wrong, if the stuff hits the fan, we won't be looking to the frontline staff to blame. We will take responsibility as management. And what we did was this. The four phrases come directly from Star Trek. Hailing frequencies open. Whenever they came across a new planet or civilization, they would just leave the hailing frequency on and they would send out a message of welcome. And they would wait and see what happened. And what we said to our staff in our little document, which covered these four things, was what you do when we get a referral, you just listen to what you're being told. Mm -hmm. And you go and look at the file, if we've got a file, and you check out what other people have said about it. And when you prepared yourself with that, Star Trek, they would go, the away team was sent down to the planet. So we said, before you go and visit this unknown family, just decide who you need to speak with first. You may need to seek someone with you, like a police officer, or a health visitor, or a teacher. But once you've decided that, then you go out there, and what you do, you conduct research, you don't make a judgment. You, you ask around, and you maybe speak to neighbours, or the family, or the ch and make sure you speak to the child on their own. And this gave us a perspective. Up comes Star Trek again. Beam me up, Scotty. It was never actually said uh, in, in, in Star Trek, but it's a known, well-known phrase of that. And that was said, come back from the family, discuss it with your supervisor. And whatever your decision you make, make sure your supervisor agrees with it. Yeah? And the final thing, whatever decision you come to, set phases to stun. This is just recognising that we may not solve the problem, but what we will do is, we will not do further harm. Yeah? And that's the end of my um, uh, example. You may be asking, is he a Trekkie? Is he one of those geeks? <laughs> well, I'll let you make some of this. <laughs> and one last thing. The wider impact of Star Trek was that Nichelle Nicole, who played Uhuru, she was the first black American woman in position of authority. She was first, first with the on-screen racial kiss, interracial kiss, with Captain Kirk. And uh, she, um, in fact, in the first series, she was going to um, pull out of the Star Trek ser series. And she, just by accident, met at a National Association of the Advancement of Coloured People, she met Dr. Martin Luther King with his wife and his three children. And when she told him what she was about to do, he said, no, 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 Michelle, Michelle, please stay. He said, you are modelling week in, week out on American TV what we are trying to achieve. And so she stayed. And I'll mention one last thing. NASA, the National Aeronautic and Space Agency, employed Nichelle Nicole to, to um, deal with recruitment, to actually recruit uh, for over a 10-year period. And she ended up 
recruiting 8,000 women and people of colour who joined NASA. And I just need to walk over here to give, and of course the first black person in space was Guy Bluford, and the first American woman. Not the first woman in space, that was <laughs> down to the Russians. They had three women in space, but Sally Ride was the first American woman. And uh, I shall leave you with this. Guy Bluford said, I chased my dreams. In the end, find what gets you excited and chase it. Well, you now know what got me excited and what I chased. My passion for Star Trek really led to me exploring the benefits of infinite diversity in infinite combinations. And I think it really formed my character. And so now, I pass the button on to you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.